All right, okay, ending of the day. So hello everybody, thanks for staying. I'm John Maeda, and I have some slides for you. Um, so just to kind of start off, um, I'm gonna give you the first thread. Um, uh, I began life as a typical uh, MIT person. I think Kevin was talking about MIT on Twitter. Uh, MIT really is a nerdy place. Um, in the 80s, it was way nerdier. Um, uh, but I had this accident where uh, I went to MIT, did uh, double E and computer science, and then I went to art school after that. And it was a strange accident um, because I was suddenly away from computers. And I just began to be away from computers, and it was really a really happy time. I remember that uh, in my first pen ink drawing class, I was drawing, and I made a mistake. And the first thing I did with my left hand is this. You know what this is? It's undo. And I realized I can't undo. And so ever since then, I was so happy living in a physical medium. But then I had this teacher who suggested I pick up computers back up again. So I bought a Next Cube. Anyone know what Next Computer was? Some of you older people. Uh, and began, thank you. And I began to write software again. And this was the first piece of uh, software I wrote, just to draw images. And so uh, it was a time when people didn't do these kinds of things in the 90s. Now it's very common today mixing the combination of skills of computation and drawing. And I was lucky to be in that phase change. Um, and then somehow, I ended up in a new phase change where I'm in venture capital now, which seems a bit sort of far away from art and design, far away from engineering, but it's getting much closer, as you know, in Silicon Valley. And I've been on a kind of a journey to understand this space. And I've been lucky to get to do it for a little over a year and a half now. now uh, when people ask me, why did a venture capital firm hire you? Um, I didn't have a good answer, so I had to have a better answer. Um, and so this is my answer. The answer is that um, there was that time in the 80s where there were computers, and if you had a computer, it was kind of embarrassing. Do you remember that? You have a computer, oh my gosh, you're a nerd, right? It's like, it was embarrassing when people didn't have computers um, because they didn't do anything. Um, but what happened is thanks to Moore's law, it got more powerful. It got super powerful. It got so powerful that everyone kind of needed a computer. Um, and so people were being digital for a while, and then now they're being digital. Like, oh, yeah, I know what a computer is. It sits on your desk. You can't use your desk anymore. Kind of a pain, you know? And so people kind of like lost interest. Um, so better technology was no longer a reason to buy something. I'm sure some of you remember the days of the Pentium. Remember Pentium 40, Pentium 50, Pentium, you had to buy one every year. Wasn't it awesome? Like, oh my gosh, it's so much faster. It can finally do something. But at some point, it got fast enough. Now, there's one company that kind of did something different, and that was Apple, in that from the beginning, it was designing and making computers. Now, uh, when I gave my first presentation to the Kleiner Partners uh, about design, I brought my Apple IIc. Ever know what Apple IIc is? It's like a thin computer, it's got a handle, it's like, you know, it's got sculpted keys, it has a Kelly green power knob. Um, really nice to design, but designed 30 years ago when nobody needed things to be designed. It was a bad business decision. It made that computer $700 more expensive than other computers. Back when we didn't know what computers were, Apple was bothering to design them. And that competency played out well when we all needed technology. And so that design thing has helped to make technology more lovable, and Apple is in a great position because it's been doing that for 30 years. So many companies are telling me, like, how do we become like Apple? I say, wait 30 years and start now. Um, because it takes time to build a culture of design. I, I love Percolate because it has this strong culture of design. It's a rare thing in this world. Uh, but it's becoming less rare, as I'll show you. So design is about this wonderful thing, like I love design, like are you a design lover? Oh my gosh, I love design. And so design has this kind of like love fest thing. But a lot of my work has been about design, it isn't just about love and aesthetics, it's about money. It's, I, I have a DE dollar sign design, like a wrapper. Uh, it's also uh, okay in Europe as well, there's a Euro version. Um, <laughs> and so design is about money. And when people tell me, oh no, John, design is not about money. It's about ideas and concepts. And I say, well, actually, if you look backwards, it's always been about money. And I'll go into that in detail. Um, and that is the reason why I launched this report in March of this year 
called the Design and Tech Report, which is available online, and it's a 37-page report that goes over the world of investing, the world of technology, and the world of design, and tries to put some pieces together. It's not perfect, uh, but it was my first sort of attempt at it. This is some excerpts of it. And it was inspired because of two gentlemen, uh, one named Brian Chesky and the other Joe Gabbia. Because when I became president of Rhode Island School of Design, the first thing I asked is, I'd like to meet some entrepreneurs. People said, oh, we don't have any entrepreneurs here. We maybe, maybe, maybe they make yard, they make hats, they make like whatever, but I wanna, I wanna find tech entrepreneurs. And so my team found these two guys in, this, in their apartment with like five other people making this crazy idea that people will rent out their couch or rent out their room. That's crazy, you know, and I, th I thought it was crazy too, like most of us here. Uh, but every year I'd go back to San Francisco, their crazy was becoming a reality. And I realized something was different, something was strange. Every time I would see them, their company was worth like, you know, 10x, 20x, 30x, and it kept on going. And I realized that they were a kind of anomaly because they weren't your typical tech startup. Back in the 80s when I was at MIT, it used to be the joke at MIT, we'd always say like, okay, two MIT people, one Harvard person, the Harvard person makes all the money off the MIT people, right? Two tech, one business. Uh, but Airbnb was a different molecule to design one technology and later add in business. But the two designers that they were were very business oriented. So that molecule was weird. Uh, and so they showed this model where designers could make startups. They're really a different kind of breed, which actually we see more of. Uh, when I spoke to Noah, I got the understanding that this company, Percolate, is also tied to creative. And so this is a very rare molecule. Um, and I thought it was rare, but I've discovered that it's not actually that rare. And it happened in uh, 2013 when I heard from Maria Giudis, who, has a, who had a UX company in San Francisco that Facebook purchased. And I was like, well, that's really strange. Um, that's a design company acquired by a tech company. But I discovered that in the past, many companies have acquired uh, design firms, most notably Flextronics and acquiring Frog. And I began to do more research, and a lot of tech companies, but also a lot of non-tech companies, a lot of consulting companies, a lot of banks are buying design firms. Like most notably, McKinsey acquired Lunar Design, a 110-person design firm or Accenture acquiring a design firm, Capital One acquiring Adaptive Path. And so this is a, an odd thing that I've been looking at, and it's been great fun. Um, I, I recently met the bankers who facilitated these sales, and so I'm going deep. Um, and people ask, so why did the agencies get acquired? Going back to my chart before, it's very simple. Um, in the past, you would buy technology because you needed more speed, a bigger screen, you needed more. And so you just bought more. You didn't think about how it felt. I need more, I'll buy more. But what happens is this thing about, remember the stickers on cameras? Like, you know, f you know this five megapixels, eight megapixels, oh my gosh, it's got so much more. Uh, we were so into that. But at, at some point, we no longer are into that. We don't buy the fastest computer anymore. We buy like a uh, in the middle, sometimes the, the, the lowest speed. We don't have to buy the best anymore. And this is a new way. Now, I was at somewhere where someone described to me uh, two analogies for Moore's Law, and there was one that I loved, and some of you know this already, and it shows like how little I know, but I was like, whoa, that's a cool analogy. And it was all about how the person who made chess was paid. And this person was paid uh, in, a, in, a, in a model where for each grain of rice, he, uh, on, on, for, for, each, uh, for each checker on a checkerboard, all he wanted was to double the number of rice every square which doesn't sound like a lot of rice you know, kernels, but it's quite a lot. And I'd heard that, but I wanted to see it. So I drew a picture of it. So this is a 64 uh, square checkerboard. Uh, and, and this is, if you double, see one, two, four, eight in the back row. This is the numbers doubling. Some of them we know, like the 65K number. And that's like at the half checkerboard space. That's roughly from the 70s to now. Moore's Law's effect. If you think about that, that means that way back then, compared to the computer now, it's two billion times faster. And if you just start, think, start now and move forward, and Moore's Law keeps keep staying in effect, the experts say it's gonna stop, but it's still gonna keep on going for a little bit longer. Um, that number gets really big. Isn't that like a big number? 
Like, I look at the number and think, this number is pretty big. And so I had to go into Wikipedia to figure out what that number was in like words. So it's like in the thousands, the millions, the billions, the trillions, the quadrillions, the quintillion. Isn't that a cool word, quintillion? Not as good as container story, but quintillion. <laughs> Nine quintillion. So that's a big number. That's amazing. That's coming in the future. Oh, no. Um, and so in that context, in this speed thing, uh, com companies have changed, too. They've had to be a little different. And I noticed uh, different acquisitions occurring. Once I dropped into the venture capital industry, I knew nothing about it. I bought a book on it like a month before I arrived. Uh, I'm reading as fast as I can. Uh, and I began looking at acquisitions of designer co-founded startups. So I thought that Joe Gebbia, Brian Chesky was an anomaly. I found more, uh, most notably in 2009. I think this is the inflection point when design began to have a material impact in startups. Uh, a company called Mint was acquired by Intuit, a special personal finance app we all know here. Uh, but it was acquired, and I think after this is when the boom occurred. Because as we all know, this mobile thing is stuck to our body. And we had to have companies that knew how to do this. The older companies didn't know how to do mobile. They weren't culturally designed for that. So the startups were designed for mobile because they had no problem being mobile. Uh, the most notable acquisition was Instagram uh, for $1 billion. So, uh, and then I looked at all the databases for funding. And this is the uh, top 25 uh, US uh, category, uh, internet category as well, uh, backed, uh, BC backed startups. And I found that of the top 25, five of them were co-founded by designers, uh, Airbnb, Pinterest notably, and lynda.com, I'm sure you read the headlines, was acquired by LinkedIn for $1.5 billion, another designer co-founded company. And so I found this pattern, and I thought, oh, this maybe is not an anomaly, and maybe it's growing. Um, and if it, if it grew, why would it grow? So uh, I noticed that when I was uh, brought on as design partner at Kleiner Perkins, and it was my first time to visit Sand Hill Road, the road paved with gold. There is, it's, it's basically an office park. Uh, but um, I noticed that uh, on Sand Hill Road, a bunch of other firms began acquiring design partners as well. So I saw this thing, oh, this is really interesting. Something's happening here. And if you look at the data, uh, a lot of companies have been acquired, um, designer co-founded ventures, creative stuff has, people say creative people aren't at the table. That's a, that's a pretty good table. Um, also people say creative people, like, you know, we have to get the table. That's just those five dots on that chart represented $2.75 billion of funding, which is a lot of at the table. Uh, and lastly, a lot of VC firms are bringing on creative professionals. Uh, every, uh, every month I get an email from someone, somewhere in the world who's joined a venture capital firm. So I find that very interesting. Uh, but it's a challenge because as you can imagine, this word design is so ambiguous. Uh, people think it's about aesthetics. It's about beauty. You know, like, oh my gosh, John, I have this design thing. You're going to love it because you're a designer. Uh, this happens all the time, and it's pretty hard. Uh, but I'm working on that. Uh, and I use Apple as an example because many people think, you know, the Johnny Ive, like, the only way to make the one part. Remember this, like, MacBook unibody? It was, like, this amazing design feat. Uh, but if you look at the actual Mac, MacBook and how it came to be, the real story is the logistics behind it. It was the fact that Apple could lock down the aluminum, locked in all these CNC milling machines, and so it was a story of logistics making design possible. That's not a new story, though. It is a new story because design has always been like this. Uh, this is a memo that was sent to all IBM employees in 1966. Uh, first line says, good design is good business, from T.J. Watson, Jr., who, as the, uh, who was the son of the CEO, wanted to, to differentiate IBM as this design-led company. Now, but if you think of this phrase, good design is good business, it's not a new phrase either. Uh, it was uh, put in place by the Germans in something called the Bauhaus. It was a school in the 1910s. And this school was, was put in place by Germany because the Germans were jealous of the British, who in the 1850s had something called the Department of Science Art, a science and art that, that, that funded the Victoria and Albert Museum and also the Royal College of Art because they were jealous of the French who could make these wares that were so amazing. And so design has been 
an economic strategy for countries. And so we're just seeing it, again, happening in the tech industry. Uh, someone told me, John, you've got it completely wrong because design is about ideas. You know, think about the Bauhaus. And so I found this quote by Walter Gropius, who was the founder of the Bauhaus. And he is, this is beautiful, like, you know, he's saying some good stuff about design, culture, et cetera. And he uses this word pecuniary. And like, I don't know what that word meant. It means money. Um, and so he was saying that design's about money. So like, okay, Walter Gropius said that, that's okay. Um, and another example, this is, a, this is called the Vienna Coffee House Chair, popular in the 1800s. Um, it was radical at the time because it was uh, put in place by a family that had patented a process to bend wood with steam. They had factories all across Eastern Europe and also Europe and America. Um, and this chair was special because you could make it very easily uh, with their uh, patented process. And what was special about it was that you could put a bunch of these chairs, 36 chairs could fit into a one meter cube box in the late 1800s, which was a good idea. So example of good logistics, good design, IP protection. So I see that Apple is not like a new thing. It's a good idea at scale, design rendered as good business. Now, when people say, I still don't get it, I had this slide here. So in the old days, before computers, you would sit around this thing called the coffee table and like hang out. You just talk, like, oh, let's talk, oh my gosh, let's talk, Woo, you know? Um, and then you had this TV and you'd all point towards the TV. And then after computers, you'd hang out with your computer and everyone has their own computer. Uh, and of course, in the mobile era, we're just like always around computers. We're shining TVs in our face as we walk around. And so something is different. Something, what is different is that the nerd moment, I use a computer by myself, is no longer valid. We're all nerds. We're carrying this around. And to illustrate the statistic, uh, I looked at Mary Meeker's uh, Dex, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a statistic about Android, about how many times we unlock our phone, like uh, 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 150 times. Um, but if you think about computers in the old days, you know, remember email, like Elm, Eudora? It was not really great. Elm is like, oh my gosh, it sucks, it crashed, whatever kind of thing. Um, it was okay because you only use a computer a little bit. You use it in the morning to check mail, in the evening to check mail. And it's like, oh, that was really bad, but it's okay, my life's okay now, I'm not using computers, it's all right. <laughs> but if you're unlocking your phone all the time to check your mail, it's like, ouch, all day long. And we won't tolerate that anymore. So experience has, has become a priority, uh, like Jerry Newman was saying. Business schools get this. And so this is a list of the top 10 business schools based on two lists. And I discovered that most business schools have student-led design clubs. Uh, and I thought it was just a, a part of them, but it's actually all of them have student-led design clubs. Why is it important? It's because business gets design now, and business schools Business students want to understand design, so it's a very exciting time right now. And if you look at companies that uh, take design to another level, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of Fortune 125 uh, have design at the executive level, and you see this growing as well. So a positive sign for older industry, which I called end up versus a startup. So end ups are taking on design and startups as well. And this was the Business Week's uh, cover in May. This is HBR's cover last month. So design seems to be everywhere. It's a very strange moment, um, which I look at with excitement and also concern. Uh, because people's understanding of design still isn't that pretty thing. Um, it's very clear. Design is only useful if you have sound business thinking. If you can like be in Brooklyn and make five glasses and like sell five in one year and that's awesome, that's great, but you can't live on that. And so how do you build the business model is so key, as we all know in this room. Secondly, if it keeps falling apart, if it's not engineered well, it's not gonna work. And so design is in relationship to these two factors. Um, this kind of design is interesting. Any kind of design that comes to me that's about aesthetics, I do not find interesting. So this relationship is so key today. And I just made this slide uh, just like uh, two hours ago. So, this was the old days of convergence. If you know Negroponte, computing, publishing, broadcasting, uh, this happened. But computing wasn't really a big deal, as we remember, but it became a player. So this convergence has occurred, and we're like, awesome, you know? And computing is big. 
Uh, this convergence is happy right now, but it's a little odd. It's sort of a tri-molecule of technology, business, and design. The uh, reason why is because technology was dominant. No one cared about it. Business didn't care about it, and now it kind of cares about it, and then now it cares more about it, you know? Uh, design di didn't matter until more people had to use things, and so now design's kind of sort of near there because it isn't about the, the nerds anymore. It's about all of us, regular people. Um, and technology keeps growing and growing, and it's kind of amazing and scary, and you heard the speakers talk about it already. So this is where we're at. They're converging. Something is happening. I'm thinking about it out loud, trying to make sense of it. And here are my takeaways. Um, product design and communication design are converging. The idea of digital products is changing marketing today. It's very awkward. Graphic designers, industrial designers are not UX designers. The problem with companies who hire these people who think they're UX designers, they fail, and they think design isn't important. So I've noticed this trend as well. Uh, last thing is that mature tech companies are advantaged because they have large design uh, groups, large design culture. Startups, less so advantaged. And so this is the three takeaways for you, and I'm done on time. Yes, so that's the done. This report is available in long firm and design and tech. And I will now talk to Dom, I think. Thank you. All right, John. I've got um, three things for you yes. um, to talk about. All right. One is therapy, one is constraints, yeah. and one is evolution. Got it. How does that sound? All right, let's go for it. All right. So on therapy, when we spoke recently, you said that um, your use of Twitter is a form of therapy for you yeah. to share your thoughts on the world. Yeah. OK. I wonder why. On September the 15th, uh -oh. 2015, <laughs> you tweeted, a company's branding used to be their most consumable layer. But digital products have changed that. True? Yeah, it's true, because it used to be you had this product, and marketing was a surrogate for the product. But now a digital product you ship it's how the product feels. And so this combination of marketing and product is so key in digital. If it's not digital, it still works the old way. OK, so we've gone from basic recognition to a more intimate relationship. Yeah, it's harder. All right, good answer on constraints. Um, I've got quite a few. Um, OK, so um, today um, you've spoken to us about how design is a driving force of change inside an organization. And without that, and without design being integrated into business, there is a constraint on how companies develop. So beyond Percolate, obviously, um, what companies do you admire and how they operate? Who are set up to win and why? Yeah, I think Airbnb is a perfect example of one that began with design DNA, so it's easier to recruit designers. I have to say in the enterprise space, it's very exciting for designers, but most designers don't want to work in enterprise. But to any designer who's starting out, I tell them work in enterprise because that's just going to grow. This is the same thing I tell them every time. Yeah. We're on the same wavelength. OK, final question. We're going to talk about evolution. Um, so from the design clubs of business schools mm -hmm. to the programs of colleges, yeah. I think I've seen education as a space that is constantly adapting, constantly redesigning their programs to prepare students to take advantage of technology. So what, practice can, what practices can the enterprise learn from education? Oh, nothing. Okay. Um, I, think, I think that companies are so efficient. I think education is so inefficient. It's, it's very sad. Um, the reason why I brought up business schools is because when I got my MBA, uh, who has an MBA here? It's not a bad thing. It's OK. Don't be embarrassed. Thank you. Um, when I got my MBA, it was funny because I noticed that the faculty at MBA programs don't have MBAs themselves. And I realized, oh, this is just a business. Um, but they're very efficient. And so I was so excited to see student clubs emerge in business clubs because it means that if student clubs are caring about these things, the curriculum will change. But if you look at design schools, engineering schools, they are resistant to change. There is no market reason for them to change. So I'm very optimistic on business schools today. So I'm very, I'm very focused on them right now as a, as, a, as, a, as a sector. OK, so we need more clubs in the enterprise, and then that will lead to change. The, we need an enterprise club and design schools. That's hot. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for your time, John. Please, everyone, join me.